Genesis chapter 47. The book of Genesis chapter 47, beginning with verse number 27. And looking at the subject tonight, Joseph's, nope, Jacob's recovery. The recovery of Jacob. Genesis 47 and verse 27. And Israel, who is Jacob, dwelled in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they, I guess Israel then means the family. And they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. Chapter 37 and verse 2, it says that Jacob enjoyed Joseph's life at the beginning of his life for 17 years. So here in chapter 47 and verse 28, Joseph got to enjoy the last 17 years of Jacob's of I'm going to get this right in a minute. Yeah, that's right. Of Jacob's life. Let's start all over again. You want to? Chapter 37 and verse 2. The daddy enjoyed the son's life for 17 years before he was sold into slavery. And then the son got to enjoy the daddy's life 17 years at the end of his life. Probably wasn't worth all that trouble. You just probably not even more edified than you was before I started to say all that stuff. Okay, just me. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, what an unusual thing. But if your son is virtually the ruler of the world, and he is the savior of all mankind, feeding the entire world, and feeding your family very graciously, and making a difference between your family and all of the Egyptians, you would probably want to show him the respect of his high office. So he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. My, what a request. Wasn't expecting that. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he, Joseph said, I will do as thou hast said. Is that the end of it? No. And he said, Swear unto me and he swore unto him and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head he worshiped God as if this was a great relief that his son not only gave his word but sealed it with an oath that this would be done so evidently this was a very important thing to Jacob Father, this is no more than a story, a religious story, unless the Spirit of God helps us. If it does not get us to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are just history teachers. I pray that we would be historically accurate, but Lord, that's not what we're here for. We are here to rightly divide the word of truth and have the Holy Spirit lead us so that the Lord Jesus Christ is seen acting out himself and casting his shadow as the light of the world back into the Old Testament days. Have kind and tender mercy upon us tonight, my Father, and help us for we if we know our hearts, and sometimes I don't think I do, but if we do, we would see Jesus. Have mercy, O Lord, for thy glory's sake and for the edification and the upbuilding of thy people. For you know, Lord, in such a world as we live in today, we need the bread of heaven to feed our souls. And we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord God. Grant that it might be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, it seems like Jacob now is happy. Soon as Joseph swears unto him that he will do this, he bows himself upon his bed's head. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter number 1. And verse number 47. 1 Kings 1 47. <clears throat> And moreover, the king's servant came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God, make the name of Solomon better than thy name, and make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. And also thus said the king, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which have given one to sit on my throne this day, mine eyes even seeing it. The bowing of himself upon the bed was a worshipful attitude. It was a worshipful position. And it evidently was so with King David as it was with aged Jacob. There was something very special about Joseph swearing to him that this would be done. He didn't have any misconception that he would have any communion in the grave with Abraham and Isaac. There was nothing like that. It was not just family tradition that he get buried in the family burial plot. But it was that he had a testimony that God had promised him, his father and his grandfather, that Canaan was their promised land and that's what he wanted to leave behind. His legacy was, I don't want to have a grave in Egypt. I want it to be back where God's people will eventually be. So he had faith. He had faith. He believed that God would bring him back there. That's passed on to his heritage. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21 and 22. Both verses start off with, by faith. So you have to understand, this was not something that just took place and they said, well, let's put it on our blog. Well, I had a real good ham sandwich today. People put all kinds of stuff on their blog. This is not what that was about. It was about faith. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worship, leaning upon the top of his staff. The translation of bowing himself upon the bed's head from Hebrew to Greek comes out worshiping, leaning upon the top of his staff. And those who know the languages say that is perfectly right and just in being translated that way. Now, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. The next three words, by faith, Moses, goes on to another era. This era ends out with Jacob worshiping God, leaning on his staff or upon his bed's head. And it is that which is so inspiring to Joseph that he, by faith, does exactly what his dad did and says, if you, when you go out of Egypt, be sure to carry my bones with you, with me. And they did. You can find that in the book of Joshua. So we find that this was a time of exhilaration for Jacob. It's a place where he was brought to be able to worship God. It was something that had troubled him evidently in the depth of his soul. God had addressed this thing with him back in chapter 46 when he took his journey and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. 
Verse 2 of chapter 46, And God spake unto Israel in the visions in the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will, and this is an important word, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Now, if you're worried about it, I will go down with thee into Egypt. Now listen, and I will, next word, also, that's not all I'm going to do. I'm not just going to go down with you, and I'm not just going to make a great nation of you while you're there, but I will also surely bring thee up again. It was part of his faith. It was part of his vision. It was part of that which God had told him. And while you're there, you shall die there. Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. He shall close your eyes in death. So this was something that was a, a matter of faith. It was something that was a matter of testimony. It was something that was so important that he did not want just simply Joseph's word, but he wanted his oath that it would be thus. And when Joseph gave his oath and was not aggravated with his daddy pressing him like this, but just went along with everything, Jacob knew that Joseph's heart was prepared to receive the request that he had made and understood the significance thereof, that it was all about God telling him what he would do. Go down there. I will go with you. While you're there, I'll make you a great nation. And I will bring thee up again. It's all a part of God's purpose. As far as we know, no one heard that but Jacob. It was evidently known, or else Moses would not have gotten a hold of it and been able to write it down. But it was a personal thing with Jacob. So this thing was evidently so much of an issue with him that he had to get it set before he died. It is uh, very wise when you feel your body is beginning to wear out you need to start making plans for the end of your life and for death. Nobody ever has escaped death. Everybody has to die. It is appointed unto man once to die. So we see that he was very wise. Now, in Job chapter 7 and verse 7, you may not know when you're going to die. You may promise yourself that you'll build bigger barns and you will have a life of ease and then not make it through the night. Or you may be like Job in chapter 7 of Job in verse number 7. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. I'm not going to make it. I am not going to be able to live much longer. My life is not going to be able to see good. Flip on over to chapter 42 of Job in verse 16. And this guy who said, I'm fixing to die. I'm not going to make it. My life is not going to, my eyes are not going to be able to be here long enough to even see when evil stops and good starts. But listen at 42.16 of Job. After this lived Job... Can you believe it? How long? 140 years. One guy said, I'm going to build bigger barns, and boy, I'm going to take my ease, and I'm going to live a long time in luxury. Didn't make it through the night. This night shall thy soul be required thee. Job said, man, I ain't going to make it. My eye will never see good. Everything's so bad right now that it has absorbed my whole consciousness and I will never ever live to see this thing change for there to be goodness experienced by me ever again. And then he lived 142 years. Isn't that amazing? No, 140 years, I'm sorry. And listen, and he saw his sons and his son's sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days he was just wore out he had so many days he was tired of days days was just too much 
and he thought he never would even live to see good come again. So uh, it's very wise, and Jacob begins to make preparation, and he begins to make not funeral arrangements, but faith arrangements so that everybody will know what Jacob's all about. Jacob told Pharaoh, I'm a sojourner on the earth, and we found in Leviticus, what was it, 25, 32, I believe it was, or maybe it's 25, 23. But anyhow, Sunday we found out that God said, the land is mine, and I will be a sojourner on it with you. So people would know that Jacob was a traveler, a sojourner. He lived in tents, no foundations. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted them to know that he sought for a city whose builder and maker is God, and that's what the Apostle Paul writes about in the, uh, what is it, the third, is it chapter 11 of Hebrews, verses 13 through 16. He was so impressed by this that, that Jacob wanted everybody to know that, yes, he believed in stability of life and and a, a place of permanent occupation because God had told him so. So yes, he was going to be a pilgrim and a traveler, a stranger in the earth, but there was a promise from God that one day he would have a place in the land of Canaan and it would be his. And if you look at chapter 48, In the last uh, phrase in verse number 4, Genesis 48, 4, I'm going to say C. And will give this land to thy seed after thee, how long? For an everlasting possession. That was important to Jacob, for an everlasting possession. So... This was something that was very important to him, very serious to him. He had to get Jacob, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to get these names mixed up all night, I guess. He's going to get Joseph to swear, being in authority in Egypt, that this would be done. This was a verbal contract. It had to be done. One of the reasons that he got his son to swear, if you look at chapter 50 of Genesis, is Joseph has got to go before Pharaoh and get permission to leave Egypt for the one and only time that I ever remember Joseph leaving Egypt once he got there and carry his daddy's bones back, his body back, and bury him in Canaan. Now, why is that important? Well, there can't be a leaving of the peoples of God in Egypt until God sends Moses and the ten plagues. So you can't have Joseph leaving and saying, I'm tired of all that business. I'm tired of feed, filling, feeding people. I'm tired of, you know, uh, shuffling people back and forth and taking their cattle and gold and land and all that stuff, and I'm tired of being second fiddle to Pharaoh. I think I'll just stay over here. This is where God told us to stay anyhow. So that could have been in Pharaoh's mind. You know what? If I let Joseph go, he's such a blessing, I might not ever see him again. So what does it take? It takes... Joseph telling Pharaoh, this was an oath I took from my father. In chapter 50, Joseph in verse number 4, When the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, he says the same thing to the house of Pharaoh that his daddy had said to him. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. Thou shalt, there shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, because of this, therefore, that's a very important word, because of this oath, 
Let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father. And what's the rest of the verse? And I will come again. I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. The oath was that which God put on the mind of Jacob. And he evidently made Joseph willing to swear an oath because they were going to have to convince Pharaoh for Joseph to leave the one and only time he ever went outside the city limits of Egypt alive. He went out again. His bones did when they left Egypt. So this was a big thing. I read that little passage and I say, da 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 Yeah, okay, all right. He was dying. He called his son said, be sure. I got a bury a plot over yonder. Be sure and use it and swear it to me, will you? Yeah. But if you read it with understanding, you come to understand that God's in this. And this is very important. And it's a very tremendous thing for God to say, I will bring thee up again. And so it has to be done between the two, can I say, Israelites Jacob, who is Israel, and his son Joseph. And Joseph then takes on not only the responsibility to see that his daddy's body is taken back to that cave where his uh, granddaddy and great-granddaddy are buried, but he adopts that as his own lifestyle, and he enters into the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 that even Joseph said, don't leave my bones in Egypt. Take me back and bury me in the land of Canaan. So then the Apostle Paul writes, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but, but having seen them afar off and embraced them. Therefore God's not ashamed to call them brethren because they look for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's a tremendous thing to believe and trust in the Lord. God's people don't wind up with a whole pile of stuff. They don't love the world, either the things that are in the world. They have that which they need. Maybe not all they want, but they learn to trim down their wants. And they find out that contentment is not getting what I want, but contentment is wanting what I got and thanking the Lord for it. And the more you get, the more aggravation it is anyhow because the county and the state and the city and the feds are going to tax it to death and it ain't going to be yours anyhow. It's going to belong to the fire when God sends the fire. But anyhow, this is what we have here. Now, Brother Gene, you said Jacob's recovery. What were you talking about? Go back to chapter 37. This made... Jacob worshiped. He hadn't always been in a worshipful attitude. And I have some leaky tires that come up to me. That's what I call brothers and sisters who seem to have a struggle with assurance. And they come up to me and they say, man, this thing is about to drive me crazy. And I say, what thing? And you say, well, this, that, and the other. And I say, wait a minute. Go all the way back to when it started. Was there a time when you were not troubled and afflicted and aggravated and fearful about this? Well, yeah. Yesterday morning, I was fine. Okay, when did it happen? And they say, well, you know, it was when so-and-so said so-and-so to me. And it really started bothering me. And I said, okay, let's go back to that. Just get your finger on that string and go all the way back to the beginning. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning and find out who was it that upset Jacob to start with. Here we go. Chapter 37, verse 31. And they took whose coat? Yes. Joseph. All right. We're starting now. We're on the way. And killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. 
And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat, and evil beasts have devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn or rent to pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son. We don't know how long. It just says many days. And all his sons and all his daughters stopped what they were doing, come over here and Y'all going to have to give it a shot. We can't get daddy comforted. Y'all come over here and see if you can do it. You know, he likes your bread pudding, Sally, and maybe if you made that and come over here and talk to him, didn't work. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down where? Into the grave. Into the grave. What's he talking to? Joseph about going down into the grave. Who is he talking to about it? Joseph. Who did he say that he would go without comfort all the way down to the grave concerning? Joseph. Joseph was the one that started it. Didn't do it intentionally. It was a concerning Joseph, I should say, that this lack of comfort could not be given. So we're going to find out that the one that started it, the Alpha, is going to be the one God uses to end it. And he says, swear to me. And he swore to him. And he bowed his head in worship, leaning on his staff. If you will go back and find out what disturbed your peace, there's an itty bitty little referee inside your heart. It's called the Holy Spirit. And he's got a red flag. Sometimes it's a yellow flag. Whatever the color it is. And when he blows the whistle and throws that flag, something ain't right. You need to go find out what was it that disturbed your, your peace. If you will get back to the beginning of it, and find out what disturbed it, deal with that, and that will get you out of it. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. So it was Joseph. It was concerning Joseph. It was concerning going down to the grave that he said, I will not be comforted. And even when they come to him and tell him Joseph is still alive, he doesn't believe it. There's just no way he's going to believe that Joseph is still alive. Joseph begins to tell the brothers after he reveals himself to them in chapter 45. He says in verse 3, I am Joseph. He says in verse 4, I am Joseph, your brother. And he tells them in verse number 9 of chapter 45, Haste ye, go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph. He's very specific about it. Thy son Joseph. God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto, not Egypt, but come down unto me. Coming back to Joseph is going to relieve this old brother of the grief and those evil days that he talked to Pharaoh about and nothing else. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. Why? Because thou shalt be near unto me. Thou, Father, and thy children, and thy children, tr children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou have, hast, and there will I nourish thee. For there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, 
Your eyes see me talking. Your eyes see me speaking to you. You know that I am your brother. And by the way, you lying scoundrels, <laughs> the eyes of my brother Benjamin, who possibly wasn't involved in all of this, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. Do you know what will take away all your depression and all your fear and all your anxiety? Seeing the glory of Jesus Christ. Dear soul, there is a wealth of people who have some kind of fixation upon Jesus. They are so numerous it takes a broad way to handle them all. Going into Atlanta the other morning, had to be down there at 8 o'clock. There was eight lanes of traffic, and every one of them had red taillights in them. And I thought, man, this is a broad way, and it's still congested. But then there is the straight gate and the narrow way, and few there be that enter in thereat. Few there be that find it. Joseph tells them, the only way you're going to get my father to understand it's me is you're going to have to tell him you saw my glory. If you have a knowledge of Jesus of Nazareth, or more properly, Jesus of Bethlehem, and yet he is not glorious God to you, if you have not been smitten with the awareness of his glory and the magnitude of his character and person, then you will never have comfort. <clears throat> he said, if I go away, I will send you another comforter. He shall take of mine and show it unto you. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is the revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ. You cannot believe in the Lord Jesus Christ properly without seeing the glory. John 3.11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifest forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Seeing the glory brings you from one degree of sanctification to another. You go from glory to glory. And if you don't see the glory, you will not be glorified. We shall see him as he is in order to be like him. As he is. What do you mean as he is? In his glorious, exalted state. I was a church member for seven years. I could answer the questions. I could pass the tests. I had morality down pretty good, but I was lost as a snake. And one day the Lord showed me the glory of Jesus Christ, and I realized I have got this thing all wrong. Joseph said, the way you're going to get my daddy to come out of this depression that y'all have put him in by telling him that I'm dead is to tell him of all my glory and of all that ye have seen and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. So we find out, dear soul, that it was the loss of Joseph at his 17th year that put Jacob in a state of entering into evil days that he told Pharaoh about and put him into a place where he could not be, would not be comforted all the way down to the grave. And in verse 25 of chapter 45, it says, they went up out of Egypt, like Joseph told him. And he came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him saying, Joseph is yet alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt. And what does it say, the last sentence in verse 26 of chapter 45 of Genesis? And Jacob, 
Jacob's heart faint, or he believed them not. Lack of faith will produce a fainting heart. If the devil can tempt you away from your faith, if the devil can make you see that your faith is not realistic, that it can't happen, maybe it was just you making that up, maybe it wasn't God that said that, are you stupid, nobody else believes like that, then your heart will faint. But you're going to have to go all the way back to when God told you and say, "Did was that God or not? Have I believed it was God? Did God grant me faith to believe that or not? If he does, you need to continue to believe it. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. It's just too much for him. So they told him the words of Joseph. They told him words in verse 26 about Joseph, but now they tell him the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them, word for word, what he said. But it had to be coupled with the vision of the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him. That's when it says the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived and began to come back. So the spirit of Jacob revived, and the next verse said, and Israel said, it's his spiritual name now. It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him when. His death is again coupled. Let me say it this way. The peace of his death is coupled with the belief that he would see Joseph. Joseph. Because when he said, I won't see Joseph, he said, I will go down to my grave. I will be just like this when I die. I will go down to my grave. I know what you guys have done. Uh, you know, you have brought me this coat. He didn't know what they'd done as far as the blood on the coat. But he said, you brought me this coat. And he said, I will go down to the grave unto my son. I won't see him till I get to the grave. I'll see him in death, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now, he says, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive, so he has a change of heart. I will go and see him before I die. So he's beginning to recover. But what recovers him completely and entirely? Proverbs chapter 17 What recovers him completely? Proverbs 17 and verse 22. A merry heart doeth good. How? Like a medicine. Like a medicine. Seeing Joseph with his merry heart. It was not you that did this to me. It was God. It was God that sent me here to save much life. Not just yours, but these Egyptians too. And there was such a strength in Joseph, such a fortitude, such a belief, such an unwavering uh, holiness about him that it had effect upon his daddy. It was being around Joseph, seeing him, Understanding how Joseph himself had the same vision of the land of Canaan like Jacob did. I'm going to get him to tell me that he will bury me there. When he says that, then I'm going to ask him to put his hand under my thigh like Abraham asked Eliezer the servant to do when he went seeking a bride for Isaac. And I'm going to ask him now, swear to me you'll do it. going to make it a little bit more sincere. If it's not proper in Joseph's heart, it will try his patience and aggravate him. And I'll see aggravation on his face. No aggravation whatsoever. He said, sure, I'll do it. A merry heart did him good like a medicine, and he leaned on his staff and worshiped God. 
Isn't that amazing? He worshipped the Lord God. Mm. While we're here, Proverbs 12 and verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. Osteoporosis is not the only thing that curves people's backs as they grow older. Heaviness of heart will do it too. But a good word maketh it glad. Chapter 15 of Proverbs and verse number 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. Joseph is a medicine to his dad. Uniting with that son and seeing the integrity of this man and how royal he was in his dealings with Pharaoh and all the peoples and how kind he was to his brothers when they had done such a horrible thing to him. It was a virtual shot in the arm to Jacob. Chapter 18 of Proverbs and verse 14. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. If you have an infirmity and you have a strong spirit, you can come out of it. Surgeon said, I guarantee you that cutting into your heart, I can fix your problem. But then you won't have any quality of life because it'll be too much for you. So don't do it. Just take care of what you can handle. If you have the spirit and have the ability, have the strength, it will sustain you in, in infirmity. The surgeon said you don't seem to have the proper upper body strength to be able to handle this. I can fix it. Your heart will be well, but you will have worse quality of life then than you do now. So what good is it? But dear soul, you don't realize, I don't think we realize, what a blessing it is to be a Christian and have the Holy Spirit inside of us. There are things that we have overcome and we have recovered from that we think was just normal and natural, and it's not. Other people have been crippled with this, have succumbed to this weakness. But God has helped us in so many ways. We don't realize it. It's, it's the spirit of man that sustains his infirmity. But if you've got a wounded spirit, he said, you're not going to be able to bear that. Isn't that amazing? There was a woman, and you don't need to turn there. I'm not in John chapter 20 that after the men left and went back after they saw the tomb was empty she stayed there and she ran into a fella and she thought he was the gardener and she was questioning him about where have you laid my master if you will tell me I will go get him and I will I will bathe him and take care of his body here was a New Testament Christian looking for a dead body. That's what they were used to in that old economy. She had to come on to the new. There was one word said to her, dried up her tears and stopped all of her sorrow. It was the shepherd who knows his sheep by name speaking her name to her. And he said unto her, Mary, that was it. And she perks up and calls him master or rabbi. Dear soul, God speaking to your soul can recover you from the deepest depressions and doubts and heartaches and trials. Nothing but God can do it. Yes, you've had doctors and medications and helps and all these kind of things good but 
if God doesn't make them work, they don't work. You can dig a hole in the ground and stick a piece of stick a seed in it, but you can't make it come up. You water that sucker till you drown it. It ain't coming up if God don't want it to come up. It's the Lord, dear soul. God is the only one that can take care of things like that. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Jacob saw Joseph. He saw the wagons. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my song and shall be till I die. When he saw the wagons, he believed and said, Joseph is alive. Let us go down and I will see him there before I die. This thing's all coupled with his death. I shall go down to my grave mourning. Now, it's about his grave. Promise me you won't bury me here. But it's not about being depressed. It's not about being joyful and exhilarated from the depression that losing Joseph caused. It's about faith in God. So going down to the grave mourning and could not be comforted is changed to the exhilaration of seeing Joseph before I die. But that progresses on to the place to where he says, this is from the Lord. It's not about you and me, Joseph. It's about me and God. This lesson is not worth a hill of beans if you don't understand it's about you and God. It ain't about you and the undertaker. It ain't about you and your funeral. It ain't about you and your graveside. It ain't about you and the service you want to be carried out when you die. It's about you and your faith in God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, just like Jacob looked unto Joseph. Looking unto Jesus. He's the author and he's the finisher of faith. We look unto him and we get encouragement from him. Why? Because the joy that was set before him, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame while it was occurring to him and now is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What are the first three words of verse 3? Do you not think that Joseph considered Jacob? Did we not read Hebrews eleven twenty two That Joseph took the example of his father Jacob and said, don't leave my bones in Egypt. I want to follow the example of my father. And dear soul, who is it that you look to to find example of how to live by faith? Looking unto Jesus. He's the author of faith. He's the finisher of faith. He started it. He'll finish it out. And remember his example. The joy that was set before him caused him to endure the cross. You need to look beyond the occurrence of the shame unto the occurrence of the reward. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured. That's what we need to do. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. They were always misjudging him and lying on him. But he endured that against his own self. Why? It will have an effect on your fainting mind. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The merry heart of the Lord Jesus Christ will do you good like a medicine. 
The S-O-N shining in your heart greater than the S-U-N will warm you and cause you to have life and growth. The example of Jesus Christ, not in the cold words and terms of the scriptures, but in the reality of the Holy Spirit manifesting Christ to you in different conditions and situations will cause you to be able to be faithful. And that Mary Hart will do more for you than Joseph's Mary Hart did for Jacob. Looking unto Jesus. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. First Samuel, chapter 30. David is at Ziklag. The Malachites have come and stole their wives and their children and everything else and burned everything down. And in verse 6, it says in First Samuel 30, David was greatly distressed. This was a horrible time. Why was he greatly distressed? Because it wasn't the Amalekites that was going to kill him. It was his own people. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. Would you finish that verse out for me and tell me how David handled that? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And he said, at that time, had the situation changed any? No. At that time, was the pe were the people still speaking of stoning him? Yes. At that time, were the people's hearts grieved and turned against David? Yes. But at that time, he was looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, and considered him. God doesn't fail. God doesn't let you down. Did God send you to do this? Yes or no? Then if he did... He that began a good work in you, Philippians 1, 6, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I will never leave you nor forsake you. It can't get so bad that you can despair except you despair of Christ himself. You'll have to throw Christ out of your heart and you'll have to destroy faith to be able to despair because Jesus Christ is that solid rock. You can only sink so far down, and then the solid rock will hold you up. I will not permit you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The middle of that verse says, God is faithful. That's why nothing that comes against you can hurt you. It can only make you better. Because it, it welds you together with the reality of your personal faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Not you and your husband holding hands and having uh, Bible reading and kissing each other after, oh, honey, that was sweet. Yeah. Great. Yeah, but as soon as you leave that table, as soon as you leave that place, bam, the devil can be on both of you's back and you lose everything you had because it was just a warm, fuzzy feeling. But... If he was worshiping Christ while she was worshiping Christ, then you got something. You know what bothers pastors? You say a lot of things because you've told us a lot of stuff. Is seeing people say amen and bob their heads up and down and then the next thing you know they're talking about the ball game before they get through the double doors. It makes you wonder where was the conviction? Where was the interworking of the Holy Spirit within them? How can this slide off of them so fast? How can they be turning straight to somebody next to them before the last song? That note on that pen, when she takes her finger off of it, and it's, mm, it's still going. Before that thing stops humming, we're already talking about everything in the world next to that person next to us. Where is the awe? Where is the worship? And dear soul, I'm going to tell you something. Where's the help and where's the hope? And I'm telling you, you're going to need it because this thing's going to get bad and dark before it gets over with. You. 
You're going to have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord, his God. Now, in chapter 47 and verse 29, let's try to finish up. Our time's not quite gone. 47 of Genesis in verse 29. There's a phrase here that we should consider before we finish out. And you could read me four words if you would, and it would help you out to read it, and me too. Genesis 47, 29. When I stop, if you'll read me four words, I will appreciate it. And the time drew nigh. Mm. Wasn't this the man in chapter 30? in verse 28 that had power with men and angels and thy name shall no more be called Jacob but Israel yeah and your words were Israel must die dear soul we are not here only to live but we're here to die. Someone told me just the other day, I know that I'm dying. And I said back to him, I know that I am too. And this is the truth. And I told him, listen, I've been dying ever since I was born. It doesn't matter how glorious, how high, how faithful, what an example you were, Hebrews, children in the fiery furnace, Daniel in the den of lions. It doesn't make any difference. It comes a time when Israel must die. And it will with me and you too. I appreciate all that God has done in our lives. But the focal point is down yonder at the finish line. And it won't be you and the undertaker. It won't be you and the doctor. It won't be you and your mate. It won't be you and your children or your mother and daddy. When that last breath is breathed, it's you and God. I've been in the room with a lot of the saints of God that saw them take their last breath. The family sitting around. It gets slower and slower. And after that one that she took or he took just then, they'd reach over and grab one. Was that the last breath? And then they'd say, <gasps> and then they'd let go of each other. Wait another minute. It happened again, but finally they waited and looked and watched. And then there was never another breath. I don't know exactly, well, I don't know at all what transpired in that space, in that room, in the things that are invisible. I'm not one of these ghostbusters or whatever, but I know that in the instant that that heart stopped beating and that body raised up, and it's amazing how much strength they'd get right at the end, raise up to get that last breath and then be gone, just like that. That flesh wants to live so bad it does everything it can to stay alive, but it ain't going to do it. But in that instant, that heart stops beating, and when that last breath is gone, that person is immediately in the presence of Almighty God. I 
I appreciate God's people. I appreciate God's people's faithfulness. I appreciate the track record they got. I appreciate the testimony they've had. I appreciate those that God has let me know and let me live with. There have been a lot of people been a real blessing to me and encouragement and a help to me. But dear soul, there's nothing anybody can do to stay that last breath coming and plunging you immediately into the presence of Almighty God. Not you and the undertaker, not you and your husband or wife, not you and your pastor, but you and God. Bam, that's it. The bottom line is, yes, thank God, the heartache came. It was awful losing Joseph. But the repair of the heart came with the hope and the faith that he would see Joseph again. And then when he fell upon his neck and wept upon his neck for a long time, the father seeing them a long way off and ran and hugged his neck and kissed him and, and put on the robe on his back and so forth. Wonderful things. And then there was that matter of faith that he had to handle and says, Joseph, don't bury me here in Egypt. Okay, swear it. He swore it. Praise God. He leans on his staff and worship. But that doesn't end it. It says he lived 17 more years. And it said it drew nigh that Israel must die. I thank God that there is one, one individual that can stand there and help you in that hour. And it's he who have, has himself conquered death, hell, and the grave. Some of us knuckleheads back in my teenage years was trapping, traipsing through the woods, came to a creek. And there was a guy that was a big old long-legged feller and he put one foot on one bank and one on, a, on, on the other bank and those who were too scared to jump for theirself, he'd grab their arm and pull them over. And I don't know why I remember that, but I, rem I think about that, Lord. You big old long-legged Jesus, you, standing on earth and heaven, foot on the land and the sea, I conquered death, hell, and the grave. One of these days, I'm not going to be able to make that jump by myself. But there'll be somebody to pull me across.